Hello. So, I greet you amid this wonderful weather to the likes of the beautiful Hammond Multiplex typewriter. Um, now, there isn't that much serial number data on these machines, so all I can say is that this particular model was produced between 1915 to 1919. And then to the right, we have a Hammond folding multiplex that was produced around 1921. Um, so basically in past videos I covered what are called single type element machines. Um, in this case a Blicken surfer. Here, an aluminum featherweight example. And basically what these machines do is that instead of having multiple type bars where for each bar you'd have a single letter in both lowercase and uppercase for striking a character. You have one wheel with all the letters molded onto it. In this case, these are typically made of vulcanized rubber, much like plastic, a bit more brittle. And as you type and press the key, special mechanisms rotate that type element to the correct position. In this case, it hits the roller and imprints the character on the paper. So, what makes these Hammonds different is that they, instead of using a cylinder, use what's called a type shuttle. Um, so, basically, it's the same idea except that now they've opened the loop and it will still move left and right. And likewise, if you want to access lower rows, you'll have to press your caps and figs access those respective rows. Um, and again, another interesting thing about these Hammonds is that instead of having the type element fly toward the paper, you instead have this hammer here. In this case, I'm just pressing the space bar since you don't want to quote-unquote dry fire a typewriter. That will, when you press a key, fly toward this impression strip into the paper, which then gets pressed into the ribbon, which then gets pressed into your type element to add a particular character. So yeah, this is the complete opposite method of how most typewriters operate. Other machines that have done this are the commercial visible, as well as Munson and Chicago typewriters. And I believe also a few more, like maybe the Sterling and some much more exceedingly rare machines. but. Yeah, these, I believe, were the first to use this style of printing, um, whereby these machines were first produced um, in 1884 in an arrangement where you instead had something like black piano keys and a much more wooden construction. As for this machine, I got it about a year ago on a local auction um, it was conducted online though, so I still had it shipped, um, and that was in the same auction where I got the Mignon, or Mignon, <laughs> number four, that I featured in the past video. Um, it was a bit rusty, but ultimately I got it working and typing pretty well. Now, of course, it was missing the impression strip, which typically rots or really gets worn, so I made my own out of Gorilla Tape. <laughs> and electrical tape, so Gorilla, backing, and a bit of a softer electrical tape front. Um, and I got pretty good results with it, though I ended up also having to try to manually re-ink the original ribbon. And that, of course, typically leads to uneven impressions because it's hard without the proper tools to really do an even inking job. Likewise, I believe this particular ribbon is too thick. So this is a half inch ribbon, whereas Hammonds are supposed to take in, or at least this model, is supposed to take in a 7 16 inch ribbon. Um, but yeah, it still works. Another thing is that these machines were typically meant to be used with what are called ribbon shields. I'll show you that later and the process of making my own. Um, and those basically help prevent smudging of the ribbon ink onto your page by basically implementing some kind of blocker. Um, 
In this case, it also helps stop the page, the edge of the page getting caught in this part and cause wreaking havoc. Um, so you can see, I painstakingly went through the process of bending this guy together. This was the third iteration, and even then, it doesn't work perfectly. Um, so I'm very much looking to replace it and also get this machine here working. So this one I got on German auction a few months ago. And it came in a lot where it was bundled with a rather beautiful Densmore number no. 4 typewriter. Um, yeah, in that auction I was originally looking to get a rustier Densmore, but bundled with a Franklin number no. 7 or something, which was a machine I didn't have yet, so basically at the time I wasn't particularly keen on getting myself a second Hammond, especially this similar. In fact, I'm not really that interested in the earlier Hammonds. Um, but I ended up winning this machine, and Fortunately, I made a pretty good gamble on what typefaces it would include. Turned out that it had exactly what I was looking for, namely, as you can see here, script, or vertical script. Um, that's the same typeface that I have on my Mignon. And here, Clarendon, which is something like Times Roman, similar, but I guess earlier, somewhere within the Roman family. And as for this machine, it originally came with just regular Roman, as well as reverse italics, which I believe are used in legal documents. Um, and of course, these machines, or these type elements, are matched to their respective machines' key inserts. Um, so of course, if you press these characters respectively, you would expect it to print the correct thing. And this one is also matched. Um, now, one fellow on the typewriter's discord, when I was sharing this machine, did point out that this guy here said Buenos Aires. So, I guess another thing that makes me happier with this acquisition is that it seems like this is an Argentinian Hammond um, with a Spanish layout. I believe there's only just one um, style of, or one Spanish layout per typeface, so it's like nothing specifically Argentinian. So they would include all the special diacritics. Um, yeah, A, accent, I keep forgetting my A, Gu, and Grave. <laughs> um, anyways, it's been a long time since I've taken French class, air conditioning. Um, so, yep, and of course, um, technically before I received this machine or acquired it, I had the fortune of finally landing myself a Fractor type shuttle. Um, I've yet to actually share some of my Fractor typewriting. I do have a quite nice Fractor typewriter that I will feature in a future video. So, basically if you think of German script or Gothic script, this is of that black letter family with beautifully pointy, if you might say, metal characters. It's a quite beautiful typeface, pretty desirable, typically go for a lot. In this case, I was able to buy this whole set here for 250 USD. Might be possible to get it for less. Um, as for this guy, that actually came with this machine. I remember when I first saw this, um, it technically was in the... the photo was in the auction lot, but I guess I didn't really register to me that this was Fractor, though at the time I didn't really know about that much about Fractor yet, but I mean, of course I was kind of excited that I might actually have one of these shuttles, but it turned out that I only had these guys, but now I have the whole set. So what this is, is a, I believe it's called a language card. Um, so basically for special type um, faces, or at least in the case that you don't want to have to completely <laughs> replace all your key legends, you can instead use one of these cards and hang it, or mount it, here, basically. Um, I believe earlier Hammonds even had, like, an existing nameplate here that you'd also put it on. Um, this machine, we have this thing which is a bit more useless, so I just stick it over there. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if this was the original laminate, but I'd say that has helped preserve it, and now this definitely helps me to more easily make use of this lovely Fractor typeface. So, compared to this machine, this one isn't really in functional condition just yet. I mean, well, Basically all the keys feel pretty smooth still, and escaping does work. Originally it was locked up, that was because of this screw here. 
which basically acts as a carriage lock and helps protect the escape the escapement mechanism when you're transporting this machine. Um, as for what's wrong with it, well, yeah, currently something is blocking this from going all the way down. Typically, if you want to remove this anvil, as it's called, so yeah, hammer, anvil, typeface, you press on that lever which I showed and it just pops up. Same thing on this machine. And then you can see differences in what's called the shuttle arm, I believe. Um, yeah, so that's the shuttle arm, and that's basically... So now I can actually go ahead and press, so... Um, if you're unlucky, it's gonna <laughs> fall out of its mount. But yeah, basic idea is that these guys get pushed and they rotate this by a certain amount, and there's a pin, which I'll show you later, that will index it to the correct spot, printing the appropriate character. So here you can kind of see that, of course, it's not really going to work well without the anvil installed. Um, this guy should be somewhat easy to remove if you tweak it around. But yeah, of course, on this side you can see this actuating pin is sticky, so I'm going to have to take some liquid wrench to it, or any suitable solvent of your choice. Another interesting thing you can see is the differences in the shift keys between these typewriters, or the shift lock implementation. Oh, uh, wait. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> yeah, if there's no return force from the anvil, then these won't work. Um, but yeah, you can see different style, also different backspace implementation. But otherwise, still quite a bunch of similarities. And again, what makes your folding type right here interesting and unique is the ability to fold up the keyboard. So if you press down on these sides, it'll come up, and it'll be stowed. There you can see the serial number, key levers, and then, um, yeah, this slot didn't come with the top, but basically imagine that you would then have a corresponding black faux leather cover, and you'd be able to carry this in a neat profile. Um, in this case, you can see it's almost almost takes up half the space as this wooden base here. So that's one of the reasons they produced this folding, though I don't think they followed up with that once the company turned into Veritiper. Um, yeah, Veritiper was quite the <laughs> company. Um, their machines, I'd just say, looked rather monstrous <laughs> and added all kinds of features. So yeah, Veritiper is the successor to Hammond, and I believe they lived up into the 60s, typically yeah, basically, continuing to provide more and more, in this case, they change from using vulcanized rubber to using metal or something. It could be painted, not sure, but yeah. Typic yeah. Typically, if your shuttle here is silver or metal-looking, then that be means that it belongs to a Veritiper, or at least a very late Hammond. Um, so... Yeah, those machines look crazy. I think I've heard of one that had like a 10-foot platen for... Um, so platen is... Well, really platen so much as carriage. Yeah, these machines don't have a platen, um, like this thing does, because instead you just have your impression strip absorbing the impact and enabling the imprint. But yeah, imagine 10 feet and doing a carriage return for such a thing. That'd be crazy, but yeah. I guess if you had drawings that big and you wanted to make nice and neat typing in different typefaces, then that's what you would use. Now, ideally, I would get access to the underside of this machine, like you can with this one. Here you can see 
mechanisms, that's for the ribbon advance. Different things. Um, and these brackets over here are for holding it into place when you're transporting the machine. Um, but as for this guy, the feet have kind of melted over the screws. Uh, yeah, I'm probably just gonna brute force break this off. Okay, this one isn't as easy as the other one. <laughs> Rotates, and that should break it out. There we go. That screw head was bigger than I thought. At last, it is free. As you can see, this rubber definitely needs replacement. Actually, looks like one of these cups might be missing. Anyways, yep, there you have it, the bottom of this machine. Alright, so now we can look at some differences between these two machines from the underside. Um, firstly, you can see, I'm not sure if it's really an illusion, I don't have a... I mean, at least that first impression, I thought the keyboard on this machine was slightly wider and more spread out than on this machine, but... Maybe that's not exactly the case. Uh, I guess, yeah, maybe these slots are a bit further apart than on this machine. Anyways, yeah, one thing is, I'm going to guess that this is still cast iron. While here, they started using aluminum. Yeah, like this machine is a fair bit heftier than this one. So, this is all basically the same. Yes, some changes in this part here. I have to review and double check its purpose. Um, yeah, the front at least, this machine is rustier compared to here where it's pretty clean. Um, I've never really done a deep cleaning of this machine like with all my Q-tips and whatnot. But to be honest, yeah, these typewriters have been pretty good at keeping their interior clean, so that's nice. And even the key levers themselves aren't really that dusty for me to want to wipe them with q-tips and solvent, but anyways, yeah, same ribbon mechanism. I think they have a... okay, yeah, I think they don't have a automatic ribbon reverse, so you have to manually flip it left and right here if you want to change. Differently shaped ratchet poles here. Definitely very subtle differences and similarities. This mechanism is... Wait a minute. Interesting. Okay, so... Wire cable is used as a drawdown by this machine. I'm guessing since this one has flanges, that's probably how they always did it for this model. While here, they use a metal ribbon instead. Uh, you can also see... I'm going to guess that this spring was actually a replacement at some point. Mm. See what each of these parts do. The backspacer is over here. Here. Yeah, different backspacer. Shift mechanisms should... Uh, oh, okay. I think, yeah, that's probably the shift mechanism. Yes. Yeah, so that's the shifter. These guys will have stops for controlling how far they move. Same thing here. And you can also see how the shift lock is supposed to work. But I'll probably have to adjust this bar so that it will actually hold. Worst case, there was a lot of wear and the shape of this hooking part may have changed over the years and thus prevented it from really grabbing. 
Also, here we have a different shape of this pivot block here. Um, you'll see on the other side how these are connected, but yeah, here you can see. But rather, instead of actually having like a direct rod running through, these simply rest on top and then, in this case, they have felt on top. Um, I'm guessing this felt was probably replaced at some point, but anyways, yeah, so you don't have a rod going through. And that also helps make it easier to disassemble and, I guess, also reassemble these machines. Um, yep. Oops. <laughs> Goodness. You'll see some more details later of how these guys here help work together to implement the indexing. And also, what these ends over here do. So, I went ahead and installed some furniture feet to help prop the machine up enough so that the escapement actuation doesn't get obstructed. You see, yeah, all keys are really nice and smooth. I mean, they already were. So, I did go ahead and apply some liquid wrench to all the pivots under the machine. Now, that pin, that pusher thing that I showed earlier, still unfortunately rather sticky. I even went at it with a butane torch, which I sometimes now recently do in order to help further loosen any old gunk, but it seems to still be pretty stubborn. I don't know if I'll have to get at it with some crud cutter and then come back, or I just have to keep on wiggling it like this. Like the other one is already pretty good and smooth as you can see. There's a return spring over there. Same thing on the other side. I mean, I'm pretty sure that this is the only part of this machine that is currently seized or just stuck. And yeah, without that, it's not possible to type. So I went ahead and went at that pieces pivot with some crud cutter. Um, after first cleaning the area with some acetone, so while waiting for that to do its thing, let's go ahead and dig deep into the mechanisms behind these typing systems. So, basically, if you want to get access to the innards, you just have to remove these screws. This guy here has a separate panel for the front, um, which I'd say isn't necessary to remove if you want to investigate this part, but I'll go ahead anyways. Okay, so we can now go ahead and remove these panels. Pretty things. Yeah, looks pretty old. Maybe some, I don't know, could be rust, but this still looks clean. Stick that on the side. And then here. So do note that you're only supposed to remove these screws, not these ones, since that's for mounting this guy. And finally, here. Pretty nice and clean felt. So, now you can see some of the differences between these designs. Okay, so this machine is still quite functional. Whereas on this one, as you can see, um, okay, it will work, but you can do that. <laughs> Um, that's pretty easy to do, um, but it's quite easy to go back and stick it right in. So the old machine used this heavier design, some cast piece maybe partly machined with wedges. Well here they simplified it and made it a lot lighter, but it's using these small, or these pieces of bent sheet metal and works just as well. So, given that, what happens when you press a key, the exact same principle on both, is that, depending on the side, it will lift one of these guys, which is contiguous with this pin. So here you can see it pushing. And at the same time, at the end of these key levers, so these are class 1 levers, 
It is pushing up a pin. So it will push that pin up, and in turn, it will block the tail. Very simple mechanism compared to what's going on in this darn Blickensturfer. And, yep, that in turn stops. Uh, yeah, fortunately, it's doing it only very lightly, so shouldn't be of particular harm to the typeface on this machine. And yeah, so that will create a certain imprint of a specific character. And that's basically it. Well, after that, the next important part I'll show you is the escapement. So, on both these machines, notice how when you press a key, there's also this bar behind the this pin array that gets pushed up. machine should be the same principle. Um, now I wouldn't advise it as much yeah because these key levers are gonna fall out. Um, now it is possible to at least do this and here you can better see how the folding operation was implemented. Basically they realized that yeah it's very easy to just have these keys fold down and then fold back up to engage with the mechanism. So, yeah, I'm just holding this carefully. You get that principle. Very nice and seamless. Um, again, a lot of weight saving tricks. Instead of using all this cast metal stuff, aluminum framing, and more sheet metal. Here, the operation of that universal bar should be a bit more clear. Sometimes it jams in this position, but it's pushing down on something at the back of the machine. Let's go there. So I put the front panel back on so you could also go ahead and see the same motion. This machine should basically be the same. In fact, a bit easier to see now. Well. Thing is that yeah, you can see this guy here. This machine also has it, which basically sets the limits of the motion of this rocker. And I think the setup to be okay. Yeah, it's easier to see from the back of the machine. These feet will just fall off if it's not screwed into its case. So now it should be easy to see what's going on with the escapement. So this here should be the star wheel. And basically, when you press a key, this pawl gets pushed out of the way. That guy, this here, holds it. Turning the carriage seems like there's some internal ratchet. Yeah. Some principle. A bit harder to see what is actually doing the rocking. Let's see if I can get it here. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, I'm guessing this thing here 
is doing the, yeah, there's probably a tab up here behind this pole, pushes it up, and this stationary dog is locked in place. I'm guessing this is just a safety ratchet. Again, I showed you earlier the stopper here. For the or no, that's not it. Anyways, the important thing then is that this pole here doubles to pull this spring-loaded hammer backwards. So it's actually the case that when you press a key, that releases that pole and allows this hammer to fly toward the back of the paper. Though in this case, when I'm pressing the spacebar, there's a blocking mechanism that prevents an impression. So on this machine, the blocker is situated over here. So when you press the spacebar, as you can see, there's some bell crank motion deeper than here. Well, actually, I did show you that rocker. Yeah, I did show that rocker earlier. Yeah, so that basically lowers this blocker, which is connected to this thing here, which is contiguous with that hammer mechanism. In this case, the tension of this guy will control the constant impression strength. Same thing here and here. Fairly similar mechanism. Now it moves like that. Well, if you just press a regular key, that doesn't move. And that allows the hammer to make the full journey to the paper. So, the consequence of this mechanism is that in order for the mainspring, which is situated over here, to have enough strength to repeatedly and rapidly rewind. press, rewind, press, rewind that hammer as you type. This mainspring needs to be darned heavy. <laughs> I mean, like on most of my other machines now, this... Okay, yeah, this guy's getting... oh dear. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's, simply put, it's a very heavy mainspring. And that means that doing character turns on this machine is quite the chore. So yeah, you can see differences in the shape of these levers. Um, but ultimately, what this achieves then is that as you type, um, you don't have to use any special or very careful and precise technique in order to ensure that your imprints, or basically how dark each character you've typed, is uniform. So, pretty much, with this machine, you should be able to produce a very beautiful print. So, it turned out that all I had to do was loosen the screw here. Or at least maybe it allowed this pin to kind of move out a bit more, or budge. Yeah, budge is now. So, yeah, I'm guessing the only problem that was that that pin was engaging too deeply. I mean, normally, as you can see, that pin is stationary, so it, it isn't contiguous with that middle piece. Um, so it would probably be like a spike that fits in. Uh, but yeah, loosening that screw helped. Helped it wiggle out to just the right amount of clearance. Now I should be able to tighten it back, and it will still be fine. Now, I still have some crud cutter in there, but yeah, after that wears out, I will follow up again with some liquid wrench. So, I think this machine's basically ready to work. I just have to go ahead and make some new ribbon shields, which I'll cover, and replace the ribbon. So, here you can see that clip that is supposed to hold on to that notch there. Same thing. Here. 
In this case, I'm trying to figure out now what exactly is blocking the anvil from fully resting at the bottom. As for reinstalling these shuttle arms, again, that's the retention screw. Um, I'd say just angle it and wiggle it until it pops in. <laughs> There you go. So, yeah, there's something under here interfering. I'm pretty sure it isn't the shift mechanism. So here you can see on my working Hammond multiplex that we have this spring-loaded thing. And it rests fine, likewise. Um, okay, yeah, I guess that this ledge isn't relevant. But here, something is preventing it from fully falling. Not sure what could be. Okay, so probably is Wait a minute. Huh. So, now it's falling properly. But once I put this guy back on... It interferes again. So, something then is rather blocking the anvil, I guess. Here, it's resting fine. Okay, so I found what was wrong. This tab here <laughs> was. Yeah, so I'm guessing it's uh, kind of like shock absorber, but right now it's bent up way too high. So, let's push it down. <laughs> Brute force until that's better so this machine doesn't have it oh goodness <laughs> okay it was bent down and it's supposed to be pulled up quite a fair bit yeah I have no clue how that happened I'm gonna fix that <laughs> okay so that's how it's supposed to be as you can see so that just keeps this guy from flying around, and again, also another feature of these machines is that, yeah, this thing spring-loaded. That basically holds these in position and alignment whenever you're lifting this guy to change the typeface. And that was a big feature of this multiplex model, is that you are able to multiplex between two typefaces rather quickly. So, yeah, typically when these are a bit sticky, I just go ahead and apply a bit of liquid wrench. Um, I've found that, yeah, of course you have to be careful with your choice of chemical or whatever you're trying to do to clean these ways. Again, don't use actual oil as that will gum up and prevent the fast operation. You can see here, it's having some struggles. Um, anyways, yeah, one other problem with this guy is that it's bent back a bit, so I'm going to have to try to unbend that. So, I was able to loosen the lower screw, but not the upper screw. And now I've been resorting to this method for just bending it. <laughs> not ideal, but it seems to be working. Okay, so lesson learned. Do not apply such forces. Uh, basically, we have ourselves a bit of a crack down there in the shaft. Um, it still works, but it's not as crisp as this guy, whereas here. Yeah, that's my terrible mistake. It's just that the darn screw was so stubborn. Um, 
Anyways, yeah, I'll have to go back in there and probably try to solder it, insert some solder to make it sturdy again. Yeah, my bad. So, as for repairing that crack with solder, you can imagine that's quite difficult to do in these tight confines. I mean, I can barely fit my butane torch's tip to direct a sufficient flame to heat the area. Um, and also, there's just too much oxidation and it's kind of hard to convey appropriate flux in the area and then be able to introduce the solder on time. Um, now, ideally, what I should have done even just from the beginning in order to help get better access to that screw which I was trying to loosen is to have... So, I already removed one nut. Okay, so note that these screws here are only for these mounting points here. But, you can see that there's another nut here. And they, for some reason, decided to put the margin release pole. Now, first of all, the reason that they are using these poles in the first place, I believe, is to allow the part to be linked to some kind of parallel component, or maybe not for the spacebar. If anything, it's probably just a reset spring. Yeah, if I pull this guy up, I would expect the yeah, spacebar will just fall down. Okay, so that's all that does. It's just a expensive way to reset your spacebar. But yeah, for this guy and the margin release mechanism, this pin here doesn't actually do anything except for just stabilize this component, allowing you to have one of these keys while also holding that arm there in this horizontal position, rigidly. Anyways, the whole point then of removing those nuts is so I can remove this part, so I could pull this guy up. And given that, if this were not there, then I should be able to just pull this out and get this end off. And with that, I'll be able to make a much bigger opening for accessing either that screw, or now that I've possibly caused that crack would have helped me better try to do a soldering fix. Um, but yeah, at this point I'm just gonna call it a night and, well, after first applying some JB Weld instead, since that's really my only option to get a rigid external instead of internal repair of that joint. So, I mean, like, it might be able to push this guy enough, but because of that crack, as you can see, on the return, even though this guy's already down, this guy lags behind because it's able to wiggle around due to that crack. So, we'll see. So it has been more than 24 hours, and I would say that the JB Weld fix was a success. So I should be able to see down there some fully cured JB Weld. Anyways. So, that means this guy does work now. It's able to reset things a bit better, but still a bit sluggish. And I'm suspecting, like you can see here, it's resting a bit to the right, whereas it's supposed to be centered. So, I'm guessing that I will need to carefully bend this guy to the right, which certainly should be a lot easier to do than trying to bend it this direction. Unfortunate. 
the crack taunts me.